And now, from the San Francisco Bay Area Studios, KLOK proudly presents to you the prominent attorney Shaw Perel for the Shaw Perel Law Show, coming at you with over 50,000 watts of power. The Shaw Perel Law Show, where all your views matter. Hello, 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 everybody. Assalamu alaikum, sastaka, namaskar to all the listeners. This is Attorney Shapur Ali, and today we are live. Yes, we are live today, August 24, 2017. So we will be taking course live. I know the few last uh, uh, shows were recorded, but today we are live. So please feel free to call. We will be opening the lines in a few minutes, 408-912-5565. And today, of course, I have my good friend Franco back on the board with me. And uh, anything I'm going to tell you, is for educational purposes only you should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided you should contact an attorney if you have any questions now let us start uh, of course during the time um we we didn't do the live shows we've seen uh the visa bulletin came out um uh, unfortunately there is a retrogression on the family f1 category moving from i think december to uh, May 2000, uh, 2010, and uh, this is kind of going to, some people are really going to be uh, feeling bad, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's the way things go, and, and things are not getting better, and so many other things happening on immigration front. Of course, now we have this rule, which was the entrepreneur rule that was supposed to be passed last month. And now, uh, and uh, the USCIS have decided, the Homeland Security, DHS has decided that they will no longer pass that uh, entrepreneur uh, rule, which would have given a chance to some entrepreneur to get a parole in the United States. So many things happening, but let me first take a caller. This is Shapra, you're live on air. Hello? Hello. Hi, uh, this is, this is Pancham Sharma from New Jersey. Hi, Panchan, how are you? Thank you for calling from New Jersey. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thanks for taking my call and thanks for helping the community. Uh, by doing oh, all thank this. you. Uh, actually, so, uh, my question is related to my son. Uh, I filed my green card and my priority date is November 2010. And mm-hmm. my son is uh, turned uh, 18 and he started going to college. So mm-hmm. now, uh, because on H4 he cannot do internship, so my plan mm-hmm. is to convert him to F1. Yes. So, uh, okay. so my question is like, if uh, uh, later on my date become current before he turned 21, then mm-hmm. uh, can we can we file like H4 and uh, uh, I uh, 485 together, like H4 transfer and uh, mm-hmm. I 485 together, and how safe is that or any issue with that? Okay. Well, this is a good, very very good question. It's unique. First of all, uh, you don't have to move to H4 to file for his adjustment of status. As long as he maintains status either on F1 or on H4, you're good if the dates become current and he's under 21 to file for his adjustment of status. So it won't affect him. Having said that, now that you're trying to put him on F1, that's the only issue you might have because F1 is not a dual intent visa. When you apply for it, and if his name is mentioned on your application on the I-140, which not, doesn't really is not usually the case, but uh, then there's a they, there's a very slight chance they might deny the F-1. But if once he gets an F-1, if the dates become current, you don't have to shift to H-4 to file for his adjustment of status. Okay, so there's no problem on oh. that. Also, oh, we can just okay? file uh, like uh, adjustment of status, like. Uh, like 485 mm-hmm. without without transferring yes. to H4, right? Yeah, you don't have to because the rule says you have to maintain status. doesn't matter which status. However, getting on the F1 is a different issue. It's not the green card that will be affected, the adjustment of status. It's the other way around. They might deny his F1. That's the only thing. But it's a very, very, uh, maybe 5% chance of this happening. But, but once he gets an F1, if the dates become current, there's no problem to file his adjustment. Okay? Okay, sure, sure. Thank you very much. Good luck to you, and thank you for calling from New Jersey. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking a little bit about this. Uh, now, this repeal, basically, even though it didn't become law, it was not a great law anyway. It was something 
passed by Obama to give a chance to people who will be investing $250,000 uh, where they will be parole in the United States and ultimately be able to file maybe for a national interest waiver. But that law now is called the, uh, it's, um, it's under a kind of an international entrepreneurial uh, uh, regulation. And now, uh, according to the U uh, Department of Homeland Security under the executive order of President Trump, this is not going to be um, this is not going to be possible. So that means we are losing that to uh, somehow, and this is kind of a little bit. Uh, scary for many because they think uh, some people were counting on this, although it was not a great law, by the way. So let me take another caller. This is Shapira. You have an email? Uh, Hi. Yeah, uh, this is Samir. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, so I have sir. a question on my... Uh, so I have a two uh, immigration has been filed, one from my in-laws, uh, and it is going to be all for 10 years. It's basically my father-in-law has filed, and one is for my work. I'm on uh, H1, and my company has filed, and I want parties approved. So my question is, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, so is there any way I can do an adjustment of status based on my in-laws what has filed? But I heard, like, after 10 years, you can uh, go and ask the uh, USCIS uh, if you're already in U.S., and uh, they will be able to do on some sort of law that is, like, bonding the time come fine. Some sort of law. That's what uh, I kind of uh, got something. Mm -hmm. so do you have any info on mm. that possible? No, it's not possible. The law that you're talking about is called cancellation. It applies only for people who are undocumented and who are in deportation. A lot of people oh. kind of confuse this law because I think England had something like that and people will mix those two laws. But there's no law on 10 years. Until your dates become current either to your to your father-in-law, that means to your wife and your father-in-law, or to your employment, you cannot really file an adjustment of status um, and they, in, in real terms. So it's not something doable. That 10 years talking about is it doesn't apply to regular cases so it applies only if you're in deportation and even that you have to show extreme hardship so unfortunately some people have been actually I remember when I became a lawyer a lot of non lawyers were taking money from people and lying to them and make and because of that that law has that kind of rumor and and false information has continued but it's not there there's no law on that sorry okay Okay, fine. Thank you. And okay. uh, I think I have a similar kind of situation for my son. Also, he'll be in college in the next one year. And oh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, I know yeah. it's kind of sad yeah. right <laughs> now. <It's>, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Thanks. look yeah. into the Child Status Protection Act. If hopefully the days become current, which I doubt, but hopefully let's pray uh, the days become current. Uh, God knows what is going to happen next, but right now it's not looking really great. Okay. But good luck to you. Okay, I wish you all okay, the best. Thanks. Let me take another caller. Thank you. This is Shapira. You have any? Yeah. Hi. Uh, good morning, Mr. Shah. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm calling for. Um, I filed for my brother many years ago in 2004 under F4 mm -hmm. visa, and his family. Yes. Um, yes. Now, um, when the uh, expecting visa next one or two years. So as a mm. petitioner, uh, if I, I'm planning to quit my job, I'm working right now. Uh, so does it require mm. that I have to work or is there any other alternatives? Mm. Yeah, you don't have to be working. You can always use what we call a joint petitioner when, when they request it. Because they're not going to process the case right now. We're talking in two years. In two years, you might get another job or pay taxes or things like that. So if you don't, if you're not working, you can always get someone else to join petition on that, and then ultimately he will, um, your brother will will be able to come. So it's not a big problem uh, as long as you have someone else who can put their names also on the case. Okay. So is is that a joint sponsor, right? Um, so yes. I am still the petitioner, uh, but uh, there will be a joint sponsor. Yes, you will be still be the sponsor, but there will be another sponsor attached to you, which will provide only kind of the the support technically, if in case they they lapse or something as a an affidavit of support. So it's not a big problem actually, as long as you have someone else who's willing to put their 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 income in it, and they don't have to pay anything. Only thing they take responsibility in case your brother takes welfare and things like that. Okay. Okay. And um. 
uh, is that ha- does that person has to be in living here with me or it can be anybody or how how does that work? can be Should it I... can be any it can be anybody as long as they either green card holder or a citizen and living in the and US they have right? income so... uh yeah they have okay. to live in the US because technically they have to show income so if they don't have income it won't work okay now now there is another thing also like asset you can show right so asset based yeah, if asset, i don't have income yeah you can show assets but you have to show five times the poverty guideline for example let's say the poverty guideline for you becomes like 30000 you have to show an asset of 150000 so yeah it is doable but it becomes okay. a little bit more work because if you have properties and things like that you have to appraise them okay Okay, thank you so much. I really okay. appreciate it. Good luck. Good luck to you. Let me take another call, uh, Franco. I think we're getting back to back calls today. This is Sharp Rai. You are live in here. Hi, Shaji. This is Ravanel. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, yeah, me and my family, we are uh, citizens by naturalization. And recently, mm-hmm. and my kids, they got the citizenship when they are uh, below 21. and mm-hmm. uh, after 5 years we renewed our uh, passport they, they renewed the passport and they got the new passports and that's all the story is all fine so like couple mm-hmm. of days back i heard that we need to file n600 for the two kids because they were not uh, they, they got the citizenship before uh, 18 and uh, mm-hmm. in the green card in the records they will have it them as the only green card holders not the citizenship not the citizen um, not the citizen so is that uh, okay. can you please throw some light on that what is that is it mandatory or uh, what is it okay it's not mandatory okay to get that because they are they're technically us citizen however because of all the mess going on right now in the us i will highly recommend that you do it it's not necessary but i recommend doing it actually i was going to talk about that last a uh, couple of weeks ago but i forgot but it's a good idea to have it because especially i know for a fact a couple of my clients when their kids went to apply for college they were adamant for the especially for financial aid they wanted that certificate although they were not supposed to ask for that they were keep asking for it so in order to avoid any kind of misunderstanding down the road or some kind of problems i will highly recommend you just go ahead and apply for it and you will have to spend some money but it's totally worth it for them to have it okay okay thank you sir okay good luck to you good luck let me take another caller uh thank you this is shapra you are live in here hi shapra hello ravi hi shapra ravi is ravi uh Hi Ravi. All right now uh, uh thank you for uh, taking my call and uh, now right now I'm on H1 uh, in the fourth year. Mm-hmm. My organization mm-hmm. is not filing green card or H1 mm-hmm. but they are filing for L1A folk. So what would you suggest like is it a good idea to you know file for L1A while I'm on H1 and how does that work? It's not a good idea if you Um the whole question first of all will you qualify for L1A yeah, yeah. So usually it's good to move to H1 rather than L1 from L1 to H1 not the other way around unless they okay. want to file directly the EB1C which is yeah. the green card that's worth it not the L1A yeah, they'll, but they are filing, they'll be filing EB1. EB1 yeah yeah then they don't have to go to the L1A to go on EB1C you can go directly actually on eb1c from h1 but you If you own a property and have a second mortgage on it, and if you want to keep this property and get rid of the second loan, attorney Shaw Parali can help. 
Call 510-742-5887. Due to the uncertain economy, many people have settled their debts for a fraction of its value. It's recommended to use an experienced lawyer to deal with it. Shaw Parali is an experienced debt settlement attorney and has handled hundreds of such cases successfully. There are no upfront fees for debt settlement. Only when you win, you pay. Call Shaw Parali, attorney at law, at 510-742-5887 or visit yourdebtsettlementattorney.com for a free assessment. This is just an advertisement. No attorney-client relationship is established by this ad. The law does not guarantee success. Call 510-742-5887. And ladies and gentlemen, we're back. I'm so sorry we had some a little technical issue from my side, so I apologize for that. And I think we had uh, one caller. Uh, he was talking about the L1E and the H1. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, but uh, it's not necessary to move to L1 to do the EB1C. By the way, I wrote extensively about that, and I've, we have done it before. Where even L1B, we get them on EB1C, provided you, of course. Uh, you qualify for it. It's not just like you can jump on it if you don't qualify for it. But you no, know, there's no requirement to be an L1A or uh, to get an EB1C. So let me take another caller, Franco. This is Shabra. You are live on air. Hello. Hello. Okay, I lost the call, caller. I'm so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The num the lines are open today. We are live on August 24, 2017, and the number to the studio is 408. Nine one two five five six five. The number to our office is five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. The website to check is attorneyonair dot com. Attorneyonair dot com. One word. Let me take another caller. This is Shah Rai. You are live on air. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Shah. This is uh, Sini. I filed my GT, and then after that, my position got changed. And uh, mm. in the letter it says similar or same position, uh, but my designation mm. was programmer when I filed initially. Now it is product manager. Does it affect my mm. green card? Okay, it depends what level are you in. Uh, what are you? Did you file also the I-485? Has been filed. Yeah, I-485 was an old position programmer. Uh, okay. Okay, so we need to, product manager, we need to compare the job description, you know, and then the code. Programmer as to product manager, it's a little bit different unless it in, un, uh, entails also programming. Um, so what you need to do, you need to sit, go on the, um, uh, on the website of flcdatacenter.com. FL, okay. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Yeah, it's flcdatacenter, if I'm not mistaken, dot com. Find the two position, compare it, and if you match it for most of it, then you look at the code also, you match it, then you go ahead, you should be fine uh, without any problem. Otherwise, then what needs to be done, a new I-140 has to be filed, and if the dates are current, then they can file, or they can file an amendment to the I-140. But the amendment to I-140 usually applies when you have a merger and acquisition. But this is tricky. Uh, unless I look at the two, it's very hard for me to tell you. Just the job title doesn't really um, give us everything. It's the job description that you need to match, okay? So match okay, the two. Yeah, my job, come close my to job description job. is almost the same, uh, more than 50% mm. similar to what I had in pre previously. Mm. Does it help? More than 50% is not great. <laughs> I like to have at least 70%, but it should work because the rules are same or similar position. So, unfortunately, mm -hmm. on, the, on the core right now, it's very difficult for me to determine that because that requires some hours of work. So, if you want to okay. give me a call at the office, we can do a consultation and go over it, 510-742-5887. Okay? Good luck to you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Let me take another. You're welcome. Let me take another caller. This is Sharp Rally. You're live here. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Shiva, and uh, my question is, like, uh, I have a passport validity up to, uh, I mean, 2018, um, mm -hmm. but I cannot apply as per Indian uh, passport, I cannot apply for renewal. Uh, I mean, just mm -hmm. six, uh, six months before I can apply, but my I-797 is up to 2020. Uh, so mm -hmm. what is the option? Is there any way, like, I can get up to full 
stamping up to full 2020 no unless you get the passport up to that date they won't give you unless they make a mistake too but no technically what happens is whichever comes first is going to be the date where it ends either the 797 if the 797 ended in 2018 it would have stopped there if the passport also it would have stopped there and um it's it's almost impossible to get it unless you are able to get a new passport renewed unfortunately there's no solution for that okay oh okay 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 <laughs> thank you okay good luck to you okay let me take another caller this is Shapra. you are live in here Hi, uh, Mr. Shah, this is Shailesh. Thank you for a wonderful show. And I really have to oh, see thank my thoughts. You. Thank you so much uh, for your so I have a, I have, Okay, I have a very quick question. Actually, my mm. uh, I'm due for my H1 re-stamp. I'm traveling to India. I have my I-140 approved and everything. So I'm eligible mm. for the drop box and I'm going mm. um, this month. Uh, my daughter is dependent mm. on me. So she's not traveling with me so is it is still possible for me to carry her passport and uh, get a stamp done no the stamp is issued only when you're outside there used to be a law back in the 2000 years 2002 2003 where you could go somewhere i think in washington where they will do that but that rule doesn't apply so only way you will be able to get a stamp for your daughter is to take her outside and bring her back in what you can do first you go to india get your stamp and then maybe you can just take her to Mexico or something somewhere around, and then you get the okay. stamp there and come back. Okay. So not even not even with the Dropbox eligibility, you can take her passport. No, because or... the rule requires you to be outside, right? So she's not physically outside. So technically, that God. stamp will not. Have, even they give it to you, they might come back and take it away. So don't put her through that headache. So it's better you just don't do it. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Good luck to you. And anyway, H4 is not that hard to get, so don't worry about it. Okay? Right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. So I don't know if I have more callers, Franco. This is Sharp. Are you alive in here? Okay. So I don't think I have more callers right now. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we had a lot of callers back to back as soon as we started the show, and I'm very happy about that. And just to remind you, we're live today on, on August 24, 2017. And the number to the studio is 408-912-5565. And for those who want a private consultation, you can call our office at 510-742-5887. 510-742-5887. And to check our website, it's attorneyonair.com, attorneyonair.com. And also, just to let people know, sometimes, you know, uh, things are getting so busy uh, recently that I have not written many articles recently. Most of my stuff I'm publishing are coming from YouTube. So I recommend that you get on our YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash Shah Pirali, like my name, S-H-A-H-P-E-E-R-A-L-L-Y, Law, uh, Shah Pirali Law, uh, and then youtube.com Shah Pirali Law. And and that you will be able to get uh, most of my shows uh, uh, repeated there also if you miss the show. But also a lot of things because I get a lot of people calling me, telling me it's very helpful to them. And people tend to be more and more now uh, receptive to movies and, and audio than reading. So please uh, check it and subscribe to it and uh, have your friends subscribe to it. Let me take another caller, Franco. This is Shapira. You are live in here. Hello. I think I lost the caller. Hello. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize again for all our technical issues. It might be from your side or our side, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're missing, uh, we missed that call. But just to let you know, a lot of things are happening, of course, and immigration is very, very convoluted. And we are seeing a lot of cases where people are getting huge RFEs or even denials on level one jobs when they're filing even transfers or H-1B. So, dealing with those is becoming a major issue. But we are trying our best to deal with them. So if you need help on those RFEs, feel free to reach out, 510-742-5887. Let me take another caller. This is Shah Pirai. You are live in here. Hi, Shah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you. For... Hi, yeah? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hello. Go ahead. Hi. I think I just have a quick word with you. Uh, you know, my previous employer, he canceled my H1 on... 
Unfortunately, if the LCA was, did they already file the H-1B or no? No, the thing is still, uh, the thing is that new employee says uh, until unless we mm -hmm. get a project because of, uh, uh, we don't know where they, we need to file the LCA. So, yes. so what, if, what is mm -hmm. other options? So I'm just well, worried about there, that. There are, not, there are not many options. There are only usually three options. Number one is you're working for the company directly. There's no problem. They just file the H-1B. That's like you're going to work, for example, for Google, Microsoft. They just pretty much file it directly. Or the second one is, of course, the end client letter or have the end client in your hand by the time you file. Or number three, you have an in-house project. The problem with in-house project, which is the only option left for you right now, is, of course, uh, they have to have a genuine in-house project. If it is not genuine, it can backfire on you and create a lot of problems down the road. So the only option at this point is either you find another company, direct client, or an in-house project. Or ultimately, if you pass the date of the 60 days from July 17th, uh, then you can still file a new employment cap exam, but you will have to wait for an approval to start working, number one. And number two, you have to leave the country and come back to get your I-94, which becomes a big headache because by the time this is done, the job might not be there. So... Right now, your biggest goal, you have another maybe one month on your hand. Make sure you get another company or talk to the company if they have an in-house project, okay? Okay, the thing is they said they don't have any in-house project as of now. So they said I need to look for a new project only, uh, either contracting or a full-time employment. Mm, so yeah, but there's there's that, the, the reason they put all those rules is actually to basically <laughs> prevent people to actually get into consulting company without having any projects and yeah. that's why they are so so mean on that but the problem is like a catch-22 situation without you working for the company it's hard for them to market you so that's and they know this they're kind of purposefully making that hard unfortunately but you need to deal with it and we don't have a choice but try to do those two things i told you if you can do that you should be fine otherwise then you can give me a call at the office. I can, and before it expires, like one week before, if nothing is happening, give me a call at the office. We can look into other alternatives for you. Okay. So right. The thing is, uh, uh, one for, say the UCS is received on July 17. So it's from July 17 to September 17th. I need to get a new project, isn't it? Well, it's 60 days, so there's 31 days in, in August, so we are talking maybe um, and 31 days in, in July, so um, you it might be only September 15. So count it exactly, okay? Uh, okay, and what is the direct number to contact you, sorry? Yeah, just call the number 510-742-5887. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Okay, good Good luck to you. Let me take another caller. This is Sharp Rai. You're live on air. Yep. Hello. Hey, uh, Sharp. My name is Naman. Um, I just have yes, a quick question, John. So, uh, yes, sir. I uh, had H4EAD yeah. to my wife, and um, she, she got the H4EAD. But uh, later, yeah. after one week, um, I got a letter from the SCI saying that uh, it has an invalid A number. And they're asking us to return the H4 EAD back. So, uh, so I just wanted to know, like, you know, uh, is there anything else that I have to do, or is it is it is it a valid email? I mean, is it a valid mail or something, or is there anything else that we can do? You get a mail officially from the USCIS. Uh, yeah, uh, I got a mail from USCIS saying that. Um, Was uh, it an email or a mail? EAD has an invalid A number printed on top of it or something like that, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. They made a mistake because for H4 EAD, there's no A number printed. So what you need to do, if the check, double check if the letter is good, talk to the a lawyer, um, maybe in your your company lawyer or something, whoever filed the H4 EAD, 
and check if the letter is genuine. If it is, it's probably genuine, they made a mistake, so you need to resend it and they will give you another one. Or what you can do, give a call to the 1-800 number, make sure that you are sending it to the right place, okay? Okay, okay cool, so yeah. Go, Thanks, yeah. Okay, good luck. And if you need help, just give us a call, we'll help you on that. 510-742-5887. Let me take another caller, Franco. This is Shapira, you're 11 here. Okay, I think I lost my callers. Hello? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now um, we're going to talk, we're, we're talking about a lot of things when it comes to immigration. We are seeing a lot of mistakes coming from there. <laughs> I don't know if they're under pressure or they have new employees and they're not very familiar with the system. And this is happening really on a, on a grand scale almost. And then sometimes people, one of the things people don't understand that there's a human factor when it comes to those cases. So people think just because their friend got approved in a similar cases, they will get approved. Well, although the rules of precedence work, it doesn't work really when it comes to discretionary power. Um, what happens is you will see many times a similar case, you send two similar cases, one gets approved, one gets denied. Why does that happen? Is because each case has this uh, human factor, this human element uh, that are, is involved, which, which is the discretionary power of the adjudicating officer. So since humans don't think alike, unfortunately, uh, one person can look at something and see something different, and another person sees something different. And that's basically our our asset as human being. At the same time, it's our drawback. So you need to make sure when you're filing a case, you put all the, the your chances on your side. But just because someone did this way and it gets it approved doesn't mean it will work for you. So make sure you work with a lawyer who has experience doing cases and I've done cases now, I've been under three administration, almost going on 15 years soon. So if you need help, and we have very good reputation, if you need help on any immigration matter, feel free to check us out and call us at 510-742-587 or check our website, attorneyonair.com, attorneyonair.com. So now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're still going to be taking callers, by the way. We still have another 10 minutes for callers, 408-912-5565. This is Attorney Shapur Ali, and we're live today on August 24, 2017. And I'm my friend Franco. And, of course, everything I'm telling you today is purely educational. You should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided. You should contact an attorney if you have any questions. The number to our office, 510-742-5887. So we were talking of, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about another thing that people are calling us about, of course, is debt settlement. A lot of people are finding themselves in debts because they lost their jobs. Um, they lost someone, they lost, uh, they have a newborn, they have more family members, etc. And we can help them get out of their debts, especially if they're being choked by those debts. Uh, especially when it comes to credit card debt, second mortgages, we can negotiate those debts, bring them to a, to a fraction of its value, and then we can you can get out of the debts. For example, you hundred thousand dollar, maybe we can negotiate it, and you pay maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars, for example, and you get out of it. Give us a call five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven if you have this issue, and the website for, uh, the blog for this is yourdebtsettlementattorney.com. Let me take another caller. This is Shah, are you alive in here? Yeah, hi, Shah. This is Amit. Uh, I have a question. Hi, I had one. I, I had I-40 approved from my previous company, and the priority date was mm -hmm. in 2011. My recent mm -hmm. company filed uh, I-140 again, but they gave the priority date in 2017. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. why it happened. So I asked my company to file an addendum. So they filed an uh, I-140 addendum to fix that. I'm not sure if those cases are uh, can be fixed or uh, there's something basically that, that cannot be fixed. Mm. An excellent question. Okay, first of all, there's nothing really to fix because you can. There are three times you can capture your priority date. Number one, you do it at the labor certification level. When you start the labor certification, there's a question: Do you want to capture a priority date? You tick that. If you miss that, you can recapture it at the I-140. If you miss that, you can recapture it even at the time when the I-45 becomes available for you. Let's say, for example, the dates become current in 2011. You can just go ahead, file your I-45, put the copy of the of the I-140 2011 with the approval of the 2017 and recapture that. So it's not a big problem. You can do it at three levels. Okay, thank you very much. 
you're welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if I have another caller, Franco. This is Shapiro. You got Avenir. Okay. Um. So I I apologize for that. I'm trying because sometimes we have the lines flashing and then I, uh, we miss it or something. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I was talking about debt settlement because this is another thing that is really important and this is part of our uh, part of our office is dedicated to that. And we've been doing it now for almost six and a half years, almost more than that, probably uh, almost seven and a half years. And uh, we have been very, very successful in getting people out of debt. And them, especially people who don't want to file bankruptcy or don't qualify for bankruptcy. And this is where we come in and we can help you. We can really help you uh, checking you, getting you out of debt. Especially right now, pe some people are buried in debt, especially when they, they, have, they have gotten out of vacation or suddenly they find huge... A credit card debt or or their houses um, are a little bit underwater or having some other issues uh, you have to have a hardship by the way what is a hardship anything can be a hardship for example you lost your job uh, your spouse lost the job uh, you one of your family members is sick you are sick uh, you have uh, parents coming and they need your help etc all this can be hardship that can be used to get you out of debt and give you a clean start and what we're doing here is not really debt is not de debt consolidation which you've seen sometimes on tv what we do here is debt settlement is negotiation lawyers to lawyers or lawyers to con uh, collection agencies where we ask them to cut down your debts completely and forgive you for part of it and then we pay them some money and they forgive you the rest and this is how it works so we negotiate for you and we get you out of it so Having said that, now, ladies and gentlemen, let us go back a little bit to immigration. And Franco, I will be taking a few more callers if the lines are open. 408-912-5565. 408-912-5565. And if you want to have a consultation with our office, 510-742-5887. We were talking in the beginning about about visa built-in, which is um, something now we have this retrogression on F1. And also, we are seeing a lot of, of really kind of um, enforcement on, on every visa. A lot of people are calling and saying that they are getting checked by the ICE and things like that. So you need to be careful. Do you keep your records proper and make sure you're not doing anything hanky-panky like we call it, <laughs> uh, in a, if it is a bad word. Or so make sure that you're doing things properly. So let me take another caller, Franco. This is Shapra. You're live in here. Yes, I have a question about Child yeah. Age Protection Act, and the question yeah. is, does this rule apply to teenager kids under family visa category? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean? I can't hear you. Teenager? So there is a Child Age Protection Act? Yes, yes. Right? Yes, yes. So for people who are applying, uh, so let's say there is a beneficiary whose derivative is over 21, but uh, what mm. child age protection apply to him? Okay, it doesn't work like that really. For example, I'll give you an example to, to explain how the Child Status Protection Act, it's called the Child Status Protection Act. Um, what it does is that, for example, let's say you file for your brother, okay? And your brother has a child um, who is like maybe 10 years old. And since the petition is taking around 12 years to 15 years old, 15 years to get approved, they you ultimately the children of your of your of your brother might not get it unless they benefit from what they call the child status protection act the way it works is you take the time for the first part the i-130 to be approved let's say the i-130 took two years to be approved and you minus it for the age of the child and if the child is under 21 they will be included so that's the way it works it doesn't work on everything it works in situations, sometimes it works for employment based also. Uh, if the I-45 is filed and the child is, 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 um, is, uh, have not turned 21, you can still, the child will get it, usually under the Child Status Protection Act. So this is yeah, the way it works, so it's not general. Basically, the example you gave for brother's uh, child, that if mm -hmm. under child status protection act if age comes out to be under 21 it would still apply to the family visa is that correct yes but you have to do the calculation
there's a math to do there, so make sure you do the math right. You can only minus the time it takes for the I-130 to be approved, not for it to reach the... Yeah. So, for example, the first... So, you just do that math, and then if it works... Like, for example, I had a case where it took, like, seven years to get approved, so we were able to minus the seven years. Still, we had to struggle, but they ultimately gave it. But that's the way it works. So, apart from that, you won't... My, get, you won't my get question it. is, when you say that in spite of the rule, uh, you had to struggle, in this case... Would you suggest, uh, let's say, the example you were giving, rather to take visa in India or it's better to take him in India or in U.S.? Means, what do you prefer? Means, you said that there was a problem that you had to struggle, even though the law. No, no, no. They were, they were, fine. they were in India. They were in India. It's, it's during the time the National Visa Center was processing the case. At that point, we claimed it, and they refused uh -huh. it until we keep claiming it, and finally they accepted it. So yeah, the fight was going on while they were in India because they were not nobody was yet here. So you have to get it done while while the, you are doing the case for the brother, so that his children is included. Because if you try to 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 kind of do it after, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So, so make sure you do that one calculation. More minute, yeah, one more minute to be specific. So let's say right now his application has already been sent because of the date of filing is there, but. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so if that comes approved, would there be any problem for him to get a visa in India? No, if the dates become current and he's eligible for that. Once they issue the visa for him, he's pretty much, him or her, it's pretty much set. But until that is done, there's always a problem because with you see how it works. Look at right now, there's a retrogression. It went six months backward, right? If it falls into Not that, everything. then... Everything it didn't go back. Didn't go back. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm giving you an example. No, I'm not saying this one is good. I'm saying I give you an example. Look at this one. It might happen for F3 also. It might happen for F4. So uh, that's where it becomes a disadvantage. But apart from that, no, it should work. But again, I don't have all the facts in front of me to calculate yours. But if you fall into that, you can always argue with them. No, you should include that child. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck to you. So I don't know if I can take a couple of more callers, but I think, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I, I will have Amit in a few, so Amit, uh, bear with me a little bit, and I, I'll, I'll let you continue the show in two, three minutes. So I wanted to say today we, we the show was excellent, especially we have not we have not done the show live for the past two weeks. Uh, I was a little bit busy, but this week was live, and we are uh, on today is August 24, 2017. So if you're hearing this show another day, you know that it is a recorded show. And we usually have the show um, at midnight on Friday. So please tune in if you're, especially I know I have a lot of people driving at night and they listen to my show. So uh, tune in and you will be. And if you miss the show, I also have them on YouTube. Uh, YouTube.com slash Shapirali Law, S H A H P E E R A L L Y L A W, Shapirali Law. Just check those and and please um, subscribe to our channel because sometimes when I have to pass a message quickly, I use this the, the YouTube channel because it goes faster than writing an article. So make sure you subscribe to it and you will get up to date information as much as I can. Not on everything, of course, but things that really are. Are dominant in our community like H1Bs, EB1, etc., etc. And just to let people know, I have uh, a bunch of cases of EB1 where we were very, very successful, especially EB1A. Uh, one piece of advice to everybody: if you are doing an EB1A and you are eligible for it, avoid using your company to do it. Um, uh, the reason for that is because if it is done through the company, they lock you pretty much. Uh, uh, as them as a petitioner so you want to make sure that you have control over your EB1A as your self petition because EB1A is a self petition you don't need an employer for that so it's good to keep it for yourself you don't want to go to then have to do AC21 etc etc when you want to change company so make sure if you are doing an EB1A hire your own attorney and do it and we have done so many of those cases now we're very proud of them so let us know. We have, uh, and I wanted to congratulate the team for that, doing an excellent work, both Aditi, Sharif, and, and the rest, and they are doing a really good job. So um, for those who want to do EB1A, even if you're a company, you want to do H1B, you have all those difficult RFEs, feel free to call us, 
510-742-5887 and the website attorneyonair.com and today I had Franco on the board with me and uh, anything I told you today is for educational purposes only you should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided you should contact an attorney if you have any questions and Amit are you here